Hi, this is Hal Donaldson and Heath Adamson. And today we just want to say thank you to you, Pastor Ashley and Jamie and all our friends there at Christ Church of the Valley. Thank you for all that you've done to support the work of Convoy of Hope. Today we're standing in Madagascar and we're in a particular village where Convoy of Hope is working to bring hope. Heath Adamson, so what's happening in this particular village? Transformation, yeah. that is what is taking place. Yeah. How we started program here in 2023 and the children's lives are completely different. The name of the village is Seva Seva Bafui. A few months ago we were here and the hunger crisis was taking lives and hopelessness was paramount. Every single child had orange hair. Orange hair is a sign that the children are struggling with acute malnutrition, mm -hmm. but something has changed now. And I look in there and I count it. I bet 50% of the kids no longer have orange hair. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, they look great. Yeah, they look great, don't they? We were met by a doctor and he made a statement that um, this is hope. We just walked into the classroom and he started to talk about the transformation in the lives of the children. Yeah, like uh, very hopeful to see that here, so. Yeah. That's that's what they see. They'll be seeing in their eyes. Oh wow! Yeah. So you see hope. You see hope in their eyes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. Hope and motivation. So across the, the island, um, our hope was that we could start with 750 children, uh, and we started about a year ago. We did. So where are we today? Well, we started program in Madagascar halfway through 2023, and we started with an ambitious goal to feed 750 children in our program. Mm -hmm. 750 is a big number in a place like this. Yes. Well, we had a goal to end 2024 with 5,000 children in our program. Our national director, Alice, mm -hmm. just told us last night, over 7,000 children are in our program today. It's a miracle. Well, that's because of our partners. Thank you for supporting this work. We want you to know that we're doing what we said we would do. We're here today. These children, these women, these farmers are receiving help in large part because of you. God bless you. Yeah. I, I love that because it's a picture of what God's doing, not just inside the walls of CCV, but really outside the walls of CCV. And if you're new to CCV, you may not know that 10% of every single dollar that's given to CCV, we take and use with local ministry partners and local missions partners across the world. We have 23 local mission partners, 25 uh, global mission partners, one of them Convoy of Hope, who you just saw. And uh, you can get on our website, look at all of our mission partners, but more importantly, I wanna challenge someone here today that your next step is to get on a CCV mission trip. So you can see with your own eyes what God's doing across the world. I promise you from personal experience, it will change your life. In fact, my two daughters that are still at home right now, they're going on a mission trip over to Poland this summer, and I'm so excited for them. That might be one of you, that's your next step. Well, we're in week two of a series called How to Hear from God, and the big idea from this series that I told you last week is simply this, that God wants you to hear his voice even more than you desire to hear it. Do you know that? Like, God truly wants you to hear from him, but the number one question I get asked all the time is like, how do I know what God wants me to do? How do I know God's will in my life? And so... That's where we're teaching through this series, and as I've been preparing for this series, I've just kept thinking to myself, I did it this week, I kept thinking, I think this series is as much for me as it is anybody else in, this, in, in the church. I really do, because I struggle at times, just being honest, me personally hearing from God, and, and I know I need to hear from God. Like, there's so many areas of my life, like uh, the future of our church. I'm, I'm desperate, I'm like, God, I need to know what you want for our church, uh, for my relationships, my family, my marriage, you know, how to deal with hurts that happen in your life, and how do I deal with this hurt? Um, I've learned this about me. When Ashley's hearing from Ashley, and Ashley's making all the decisions, I can screw it up quick. Anybody else out there? Like, I can run into a brick wall really, really fast. But I know that when I'm hearing from God and then doing what God wants for me, there's a momentum that develops that I seem like I can, God just has me breaking through all sorts of barriers in front of me, no matter what the wall is. And then the goodness God can bring in your life when you're hearing from him and doing his will, it's, it's beyond measure. So I don't know, does anybody else here need some momentum in your life? Anybody else need some goodness? It happens when you hear from God and then you obey. So last week, I taught you the clearest way to hear from God 
which is through God's word. And I, I pray some of you like re-engage with God's word last week and we gave you a bunch of tools, Bible reading plans, and I really pray that you're, you're doing that because I think that's the clearest way you can hear from God. It's through his, it's, it's, God's word is his breath into our lives. But today I wanna talk to you about this. I wanna talk to you about the most personal way you can hear from God and that is through prayer. Now some of you just sighed. You're like, ah. Oh. Because you know that this is not like a strong suit for you, right? Like you've struggled with prayer. Um, I would say of all the weeks throughout this series, this is the one prayer that I still struggle with the most. And what some of us know is we know that there's power in prayer. We're just not sure if our frequency is good enough because we don't pray very often. Or we're not even sure how to pray if, if we're doing it right. And if you've ever struggled with prayer... I want you to know today you're in great company. Not just with us, but did you know in Scripture there is only one recorded thing that Jesus' disciples asked him to teach them? Did you know that? I mean, think about that for a minute. Only one thing in Scripture that Jesus' disciples came to him and said, hey, we need you to teach us this. Now, I put myself in the disciples' shoes. I'm like, if I was one of the disciples and I had one shot and say, Jesus, teach me this, I'd be like, Jesus, teach me how to walk on water. That's sweet, you know? (laughs) Or how about turning water into wine? Anybody else out there? I'd be like, I'd have Wooldridge Wine Co. You know, I'd be like just cranking out the finest bottles of wine and people would be like, how do you make it so fast? Just have my ways, you know, turn water. You know, I mean, I, I don't know. There's only one thing. In all of scripture, the disciples show up and say, Jesus, we're struggling so much with this. We need you to teach us. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. So Jesus is praying. We don't know where he's praying. We don't even know what he's praying about. But apparently the disciples could hear Jesus praying, and they were watching him, and here's what it says. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, this is a really weird request at face value. Now, think about this. If you know anything about Jewish history, um, every single one of the 12 disciples grew up in a Jewish home, all right? And every single young boy from a young age and young girl from a young age went to school, and they were taught exactly how to pray. In fact, All the disciples likely would have prayed three times a day, and they would have been taught these very scripted prayers to pray. Twice a day, they would have prayed the Shema, which came straight from Deuteronomy chapter 6, very scripted prayer. So all of them had been taught their whole entire lives how to pray, and yet now they're asking Jesus, Jesus, teach us something that we've been taught our whole entire lives. The only explanation to me is that when they heard Jesus pray, it was crazy different than everything else they saw with prayer. I think when they saw Jesus pray, they saw him communicate with God in a way that they'd never seen before. That Jesus heard from God and he was different. He knew exactly what to do. And they're like, when I pray, I don't know, I don't, I'm not hearing from God that way. And so they go to Jesus and they're like, your prayer life is so different than everything else we see. Would you please help us learn how to pray? Now, maybe some of us wouldn't be that different than the disciples. Like maybe you growing up, you were kind of taught some scripted prayers growing up. Anybody else? Like at dinner time or at bedtime, you know, it's like good food, good meat, good God, let's eat. Anybody else pray something like that? Or, you know, we, we had prayers we'd say like, God, Lord, God, bless this food to the bounty of our bellies, you know, or whatever your prayer was, you know. How about when you were tucked into bed? Anybody else have like a standard prayer your, your parents taught you being tucked into bed? You know, now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep if I should die. You know, the, the comedian Tim Hawkins points out how creepy that prayer is. <laughs> I mean, Matt, just picture yourself sitting down with your kids tonight and going, look, all right, kids, Put your hands together. Mom's going to pray a really sweet prayer with you. Ready? (laughs) Pray after me. Now I lay me down to sleep. (laughs) If I should die. (laughs) Mom, am I going to die? You might if you don't start listening to mom and dad a little more, buddy. Okay? It's like, I mean, think about how creepy these are. I mean, a a lot of us, we, we learn kind of these scripted 
or, or like, you know, very rigid liturgical prayers growing up. But do we truly learn how to pray? The disciples, they had this too, and they're like, Jesus, teach us. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with, with saying a scripted prayer. But I just want to ask you today, when you pray a scripted prayer, is it bringing life into you? Are you hearing directly from God when you pray those scripted prayers? And if the answer is yes, that's awesome. But let me put it this way. Imagine any other relationship you have in this world with your spouse or with a friend, and every single day you say the same five scripted lines to them every single day. How would that relationship go? My wife would be like, you're not even talking to me, right? So there's nothing wrong with scripted prayers, but just think about that in any other area of your life. When Jesus prayed, what we see from his prayer, and you're gonna see it in just a minute, is it wasn't rigid, it wasn't liturgical, it was so relational. Remember, prayer is just simply talking to God. And so what I wanna do today is I just wanna take this teaching from Jesus and I just want us to sit at the feet of Jesus, all of us, and say, Jesus, would you teach us at CCV to pray because we wanna hear from you? How do you pray to hear from God? The very first thing Jesus teaches us, and I'm gonna take the Lord's Prayer out of Matthew chapter six today, if you wanna turn there. The very first thing Jesus says is so simple, but I'm just not gonna gloss over it. Because in Matthew chapter six, verse five, Jesus says this. He says, and when you pray. Everybody say when, when. Notice that Jesus doesn't say if you pray. He says when you pray. In other words, the assumption by Jesus when he's teaching is that you would pray regularly, all the time. He's, he's basically saying this. Jesus says prayer isn't optional in the life of the Christian. It's indispensable. And Jesus modeled to pray all the time. In Luke 5, 16, Jesus, it says this, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Regular, daily, scheduled prayers. If you want to learn to pray, here's the first thing I want to tell you today. Start praying regularly, not just, not just spontaneously, but scheduled. Now, when do many of us uh, pray? When's the only time we pray? When we're in trouble, right? God, you gotta get me out of this mess that I made that I wouldn't even be in if I would have prayed to you before I got in this mess. But can you get me out of this mess, please? Right? And listen, there is no shame in praying when you're in a mess. God wants you to come to him in the mess. Don't ever shy away when you've messed up of going to God in prayer. The point is just simply this. Don't just pray spontaneously, which is awesome to do. You can't just develop a relationship with someone if you only talk to them when you're in trouble. We're, we're just pray scheduled, regular prayers. I mean, scheduled seems weird, but you should set an appointment with God. I mean, most of us throughout the week, we have appointments for coffee or work meetings with people we don't even like. Why not schedule a meeting, a prayer time, with the God of the universe who's desperate to talk to you, right? So I think scheduling is really, really important. Now, I believe one of the best times to schedule prayer more than any other time is right after you've read God's word. Which means if you were here last weekend, you know we, we said one of the things we're gonna do if we wanna hear from God is we're gonna have a consistent, regular time daily that we're in God's word. And I'm just telling you, your schedule should be getting God's word and then right afterwards, bake in some time to pray to God about what you're reading and what you're hearing and what you think he's speaking into your life. Because let me put it this way, the most effective prayers to God start with God's word. So I think if you're gonna schedule a time, whatever time you picked to start being in God's word regularly, just pick a time right after that. You can pray spontaneously throughout the whole entire day. Whatever's going on in your life, God wants to hear from you. But sometimes the appointments you get deeper in prayer, you can hear better. It's no different than going on a date night with your spouse, right? You talk with your spouse all day long, but on those scheduled appointment times when you've scheduled with them, that's when you get deeper and really get to know them. Same thing happens with God. But here's what some of us are thinking. That's awesome, I'll, I'll schedule some time, I wanna, I wanna pray to God, but some of us are thinking this, I don't even know how. Like how would I actually pray in a way that I can actually hear from God because some of us are like, I don't even know if I'm doing it right. And if that's where you're at, that's exactly what Jesus addresses next. He's gonna teach us how to pray. 
Here's what he says, Matthew 6, chapter 9. Jesus says, this then is how you should pray. Everybody say how. In the next five verses, Jesus gives us the Lord's Prayer. 47 Greek words total. And it is the most powerful example of how we're supposed to pray. But I want to tell you this up front. The most misunderstood thing about the Lord's Prayer is that it's designed to be read word for word as a liturgy or structure. And I want to tell you right up front, I do not believe that's the case. Now, now don't be offended. If you pray the Lord's Prayer like word by word, word for word, there's nothing wrong with that. That's awesome. In fact, when I was growing up, every Sunday after church, our family would sit down for like a dinner and we would say the prayer, the Lord's Prayer every Sunday as a family um, out loud together, like word for word. And I learned it. It was awesome. But I'm telling you, I do not believe the Lord's Prayer was given for us to say word for word. And let me, let me just prove it to you. Look at the verse again. What did what, what Jesus say? This then is how you should pray. What does Jesus not say? He doesn't say this is what you should pray. He doesn't say this is what you should pray word for word. He says this is how you should pray. In other words, the Lord's Prayer, let me say it this way, the Lord's Prayer isn't a liturgy, it's theology. It's a framework. The Lord's Prayer isn't a word-for-word script, it's a framework for how we should pray to actually hear from God. And so what I want to do today, and you know when I teach, I like to try to simplify things, because I don't think God's Word should be complex for you. Um, I think we can simplify it to a point where we really understand it and use it. So what I want to do today is I just want to give you the Lord's Prayer, the structure and framework of the Lord's Prayer in three parts. There's, I think there's three parts of the Lord's Prayer, and I'm going to challenge you to start praying. I put in an acronym that I've heard. This isn't original to me, but an acronym. I'm going to challenge you to pray DSA. Okay, how are we going to pray? We're going to pray using DSA. DSA is the three parts and structures of the Lord's Prayer, and I'm going to give them to you right up front And then I want to walk through each of these so all of us can learn to pray in a way where we can hear from God and do what he wants. You ready? Here's the DSA. D stands for, number one, we're going to declare who God is. Right up front. So important. You'll see this clearly. The S stands for, we're going to surrender, right? I'll surrender your will for God's in advance. And then the A is ask God for what you need. So we're going to declare who God is, we're going to surrender, and then we're going to ask. Now, when you look at these three, what do we normally think of as prayer? One, two, or three. What do we, what do you think? We only think of three, right? I mean, we just walk straight into God's, God's room, we're like, just like a, you know, we're like, gimme, 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 gimme. Now, any of you parents had your kids just run up to you and be like, gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give gimme, 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 gimme? How much do you think they want to hear from you when all they ask for is a bunch of gimme's? And it's not that you don't care, of course. No good parent doesn't want to lovingly give their kids exactly what they need and then a little extra. But we have to start with a structure and framework where we can actually hear God, not just jump to all the asks. So as we walk through these three, I wanna give you a big idea for this message. This is the big idea I hope God sinks into your heart today. If you wanna write this down, I think it's a really big deal. Ready? Prayer isn't about asking God to do our will, it's about God aligning us to do his. Can I say this again? What is prayer? Prayer is not primarily about us asking God to do our will. God, do, 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 do this for me. It's about God aligning us to do his will. Let's walk through the Lord's Prayer, these three parts. I think you're gonna see this really, really clearly. What's the very first thing we're told to do when Jesus teaches us the Lord's Prayer is that we're gonna declare who God is. Watch this in Matthew chapter six, verse nine. This is how you should pray, Jesus said. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus starts the Lord's Prayer with probably the most revolutionary thing that's said about God 
in all of scripture. I mean, you could, you, could, you could argue it's just the most revolutionary thing. He says that we should start by addressing the God in heaven as what? Our Father. It would be, I couldn't even come close to overstating how radical that would have been, not only for the disciples at this time, but for many of us, even to this day. Understand this, when Jesus said this, never once in all of scripture or any Jewish literature had anyone ever referenced God as Father, ever. The word Jesus used here in the Aramaic was the word Abba. It's hard to translate Abba, the closest English equivalent that we would have today is the, is the word daddy. It's the most endearing term you could have for a father. Now, the word father is used 14 times throughout the Old Testament before Jesus shows up, and never once is it ever from an individual addressing God as father, ever once. In fact, let me just read you what maybe one of the most foremost New Testament theologians wrote. His name is Joachim Jeremiah. He said this, there's not a single example of the use of Abba as an address to God in the whole Jewish literature. And yet here Jesus says at the very, very beginning to his disciples, I want you to address God as Abba, Father. What changed? What changed? Jesus did. Because Jesus changes everything. When Jesus comes into your life, let me just show you what Jesus says happens John chapter one, verse 12, Jesus says this, but to all who believed and accepted him, you've given your life to Jesus, I believe, and you're baptized. He says he gave the right to become what? Children of God. Now this is radical. When you give your life to Jesus and he comes into your life, you are now a child of God. And that's why Galatians chapter four, verse six says this, and because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts so what happens when you give your life to Jesus, his spirit comes into you, prompting us to call out what? Abba, Father. When Jesus came, God sent his only son to die for us. It changed our relationship with God forever. We are now reconciled with God. All of our sin and past gone. We are now children of God. I wanna ask you a really deep question today. When you pray to God, do you think of him as an amazing good Father? And the answer for some of us is no. Like we, we look at God as a dictator, or he's distant, or he's got a lightning bolt just ready to poof when you mess up, right? I mean, I've talked to so many people I've invited to church, and I'll invite someone to church sometimes, and they'll go, I couldn't step foot in a church. God would strike me with lightning. And I always laugh because I'm like, oh, if you only understood how much God loves you, you have such a misunderstanding of who God is. That's not who he is. What's the issue for so many of us, the reason why it's so hard to see God as a perfect father? The issue is our earthly father. So many of us had a really tough relationship with our earthly father, which has affected our view of our heavenly father. Over Easter, I was um, talking to some people getting ready to get baptized, and I, I saw a young man, and I just asked him, I had kind of a hunch, I said, have you put this off for a while, getting baptized? And he said, I have. I said, what, what, what made you hold off? And he said, I had a really tough relationship with my dad. And I just looked at him and I just said, hey, me too. I just said, you know, my, I love my father so much, but my, my dad and I, my dad and I have had a choppy relationship at times. And it's really good right now, but I just know, I know how much that, that relationship can sometimes affect your view of your heavenly father. And so I want to say this lovingly to someone today. I want you to look me right in the eyes. Your father in heaven is nothing like your earthly father. And that's especially true if you had a really tough father relationship here on earth. But I want to say, even to those of you that had an awesome father, I want you to know that your heavenly father is not like your earthly father. I look at my girls right now, and I know my girls are going to watch this. They're, they're, they'll be in a service. And I just want to tell Carly, Kennedy, and Avery, your heavenly father is not like your dad. Your dad messes up. Your dad's not perfect. Your dad's blown up on you. 
Your dad's let you down, and your heavenly father never will. So we have to get beyond this idea that he is not a good and perfect father. Why? Because if you don't view him and declare who he is right up front, you'll miss out on hearing from him because if you don't think he's good and an awesome father, you won't even be open to what he has to say. Does that make sense? So what do we do? We declare who God is. He's the perfect father. And then we don't just declare he's father. What are we told to do? We're to say, hallowed be his name. Hallowed just is the word holy. It just means to be holy. And what we're told here with the word holy is this. Watch. God is above us. Holy just means separate, different. He is, he is so far above us. He knows better than us. And I want to say something very controversial, maybe a little controversial, but I hope you hear it in the spirit in which I say it. There's a lot of talk nowadays about God as our friend. Now, that's not bad, okay? God loves you. And, so, and some, some of that language is helpful. But we're not told in the Lord's Prayer to address God as a friend, but as what? A father. A friend is on equal footing with you. And sometimes you can listen to your friends or say you're stupid, right? When someone's above you and holy, we submit to them. So listen, God is your friend, that's fine, but listen, God's not your buddy. God's above you, he's holy, he's a perfect father, he loves you desperately, but he's not on equal ground with you. Why is that so important? Listen, because of the second thing we're told to do in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What's the second thing we're told to do? To surrender. Watch this clearly. Verse 10, your kingdom come, my, oh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are told right up front to surrender. This is probably the most skipped portion of the Lord's Prayer. I would say in my prayer life, this is the one I gloss over all the time. I'm like, God, you're good. Let me ask you for what I need. And surrender is us stopping and saying, God, this is about you and your will, not mine. Now, why is this so hard for some of us? Because we have our little kingdom here on earth, right? We're like, God, look at my business. I need your help. Have you seen my bank account? It needs some help right now. Have you noticed how long I've been single? Are you seeing this? Like that guy, he needs to be the one. And look at my marriage. God, fix her. (laughs) Do you understand what I need? And here's what God's saying. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Listen to what God says. I already know what you need before you've asked. Did you know that? That's what Jesus says right before he teaches the Lord's Prayer. Matthew chapter 6, verse 8. Your father knows what you need before you ask. Some of us are like this. Then what's the point of prayer? If God already knows, why should I even ask? I don't know, parents. If you know a lot of your kids' needs, do you still like it when they come and talk to you? And sometimes when they come and talk to you about their needs, they ask in a way that's not going to actually meet their needs, right? Mom and Dad, I'm hungry. I want some candy. (laughs) And you're thinking like, that's going to satisfy for a moment, but then you're going to left, be left empty and desolate afterwards, little, little kid. And God's doing the same thing. He says, I want you to ask. I want you to ask. You're going to see that really clearly. But the first thing we do is we got to surrender our will to his. Why? Because prayer isn't about us asking God to do our will. It's about God aligning us to do his. Now take a deep breath. That's tough, isn't it? Like, it's tough there all the way up front to say, God, I want to surrender to you. But remember, prayer's designed to be a two-way street, not just us doing all the talking, but pausing and saying, God, I just want to listen. I want to hear what you want to say. And some of us, we we don't do a lot of listening. But we need to because, hey, has God ever, you ever asked God for something that he didn't answer and you're glad he didn't know? Garth Brooks? Some of God's greatest gifts are what? Unanswered prayers. Some of you, that unanswered prayer, he was a loser. And you didn't know. And God protected you. But what happens when you've been praying to God about something you need, and he doesn't seem to be answering on your timeline, on your agenda? And it's it's something you really need. Hey, what about this? What about physical healing? What about praying to God and say, God, I need some physical healing. You ever prayed to God? for healing and he's not operating on your timeline? 
How frustrating can that be? And I want you to see the story today of someone in our church, that that is their story. I want you to listen to how they ultimately got to a place of just surrendering through it all to say, God, not my will, but yours. Watch, watch Alexa's story. I was in graduate school. I had an incredible opportunity to go on a medical service trip to Botswana, Africa. And um, while we were on the medical service trip, we got to go on a safari at the end of our service trip. While we were on the safari, a rhino actually charged our safari jeep head on, picked up our jeep and threw it. I was able to come back to the United States, um, but over the course of four months, I had some withstanding injuries to my spine and ended up paralyzed from the waist down. I actually spent 10 months paralyzed and on bed rest. Um, I had to move home, live with my parents. My mom was my full-time caretaker. And, you know, I had a lot of time to kind of think about what life was going to look like and if I was going to get to achieve any of the things that I had set out for myself, career goal-wise, um, you know, all those personal aspirations that we have. And I didn't know if my life was gonna turn out the way that I thought it would. Over the course of that 10 months of being paralyzed, I had five neurosurgeons tell me that I would never be able to walk again. During that time, I had two spinal surgeries that failed. I expected God to heal me the first two times when I went into those surgeries. Even though I didn't truly surrender at that point, um, you know, I was asking God to heal me and I didn't feel like he was hearing me. I do think that the hardest part is to not stop communicating with him. It's really easy to want to push him away in those moments and distance yourself and believe that, you know, well, if God's not going to help me or if I don't feel like he's showing up for me, then I'm just going to do this myself. Going into my third surgery, I realized, you know, it's God's will that matters, not mine. And if he did not heal me, that that was okay. And the morning of that third surgery, I prayed for the first time in several years because I wanted him to know that I was in alignment with his will for me. I asked, you know, God, if he would allow me to continue to be a light for all the people that I interacted with, other patients I was in rehab with, and that I would continue to lean into him for strength. You know, if I wasn't making those um, milestone markers for my therapy goals that day, that I would celebrate the wins that he allowed me to achieve. And I went into it more as this is a partnership of me and God together. So over the course of my rehab, I actually you know, graduated from a wheelchair to a walker to a cane, and I was able to walk again. God has transformed my life in incredible ways through prayer. I'd start every day in prayer, I'd pray throughout the day, I'd close my day in prayer, and I continue to try to do that, you know, in my life. It's allowed, you know, me to have the most fulfilling life I possibly could have. Even if you're afraid to come to God or you don't think that you have the right words or you know how to pray, there's no right or wrong way to do it. He just wants and craves, you know, that communication and that relationship with us and having that intimacy where we are relying on him and in alignment with him because we are looking towards his will. You know, my story is just a true testament of what God can do, that he's the master physician, that he is a miracle worker, and the battles will always continue. We're always gonna have earthly battles and things that we're facing, but we have to continue to rely on him and lean into him when we truly do lean into Him and His will and have that constant communication with Him in prayer and say, God, you know, what do you want for me? How are you gonna use this in my life? And I trust you, He will deliver. And it's brought me an overwhelming amount of peace. I, I wanna acknowledge that that's hard for some of you to hear because you need healing and you don't have a story of healing like Alexa does. And I just want you to be reminded of her story that neither did she for years. 
two failed surgeries. But the most powerful part of her story is going into the third surgery. Did you hear the language of surrender? God, I surrender my will to yours. Whatever you want done, healed or not. And I just want you to know that I think maybe God was waiting, I don't know, for Alexa to get to a place of total surrender where she was at. And maybe God's waiting for some of you to just get, get to the same place of just will you surrender to his will. You know what surrender looks like? This is what I think it looks like. Us going to God and saying, God, the answer is yes before I even know what you'll say. Are you surrendered? Are you that surrendered to God who knows best? If not, I'll just tell you from personal experience, it's just hard to hear from God because we have our agenda that kind of trumps God's. So how surrendered are you? You know what surrender looks like for some of us? And I can't confirm or deny this has ever happened in my marriage, and it has. But you, you ever been in the car and you ask your spouse, like, hey, where do you want to eat tonight? And she says what? Anything, anywhere. I'll go anywhere. I'm like, oh, sweet. Let's go to Mexican food. Oh, you know, I think we just had that. I'll, oh, that, that's cool. Maybe not Mexican food. You want to go to Thai food? That's too spicy. I'm not in the mood for Thai food. Oh, cool. You want to go to Italian? I think that's going to upset my stomach. How about sushi? Ah, the smell. I'm just not into it tonight. How about pizza? I was thinking we go to pizza tonight. Oh, really? So the whole time you had pizza on your mind, when you said anything, you meant pizza, right? <laughs> Anybody else been there? This is kind of, isn't this how we approach God? We're like, God, anything you want, as long as what, it's what I want. And God's like, how surrendered are you going to be? So what are we going to do? We're going to surrender. We're going to surrender. God, it's your kingdom. It's your will. And we do this right up front. Some of us are like, that's awesome. But I want to ask him. I got to ask him for some stuff. Okay, that's the third thing. Remember, we declare who God is. We surrender our will. And then we get to ask. And God, and God, Jesus tells us in the Lord's Prayer, he tells us lots of things to ask for. He says, ask for our daily bread. God, give us our daily bread. Notice he doesn't say annual bread. He said daily bread. So God wants to provide for your needs, not all your greeds. But hey, no request is too small for God. You ask God anything you need. And God, forgive us. Like forgive us our debts, and I, I know I've got things I need to ask forgiveness for, and then I need to forgive other people that have hurt me in my life. And then God, by the way, at the end, I, I, I want you to deliver me from temptation. Like keep me from temptation to deliver me from the evil one. Because I know there's things in this world that are going to tempt me, and I know that there's an evil enemy I've got, Satan, who wants to come after me and my marriage and my kids. So God, I'm, I'm just going to need you. I'm going to ask for all my needs. But look at this list. Look at this list. Here's the structure of our prayers. We start by declaring who God is. We surrender our will to his, and then we ask. Now look at these for just a minute and just ask the question again. Which one of these is likely missing from your prayer life? And let me tell you which one's missing from my prayer life. The thing that's missing from my prayer life more than almost anything else is I skip over surrender. It's easy for me to declare who God is. It's easy for me to ask for what I need, but I'm just confessing before you, our church, that your pastor, I don't always walk into prayer like fully surrendered. And I just know if I'm gonna hear more from God, if we're gonna hear more from God, it takes this level of prayer God, I want to start by declaring who you are, surrendering, and then I'm going to ask. Because remember, what's the point of prayer? The point of prayer isn't about us asking God to do our will. It's about God aligning us so we can do his, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. Remember, it's perfect for you. So what, what's our posture? God, the answer is yes before I even know what you're going to say. And I'm just going to challenge you this week that you, you just start praying using this structure. Um, listen, it's not scripted. 
You don't have to have any special words. You don't have, there's no holy words you have to say to God. You understand that? It's just a conversation with God. That's all prayer is. And God, I just want to declare who you are up front. You're my Father. You're holy. I'm going to surrender and I'm going to ask. And what I want to do right now is I want to close our service by just modeling this. Don't, don't get hung up on my words. I just want to model this prayer for all of us because I want to challenge you this week to start praying this way so you can hear from God. Let's pray together. Father, we want to just not gloss over that word that you're our heavenly father, you're good. And you know better than us. And so you're, you're holy. God, we're not. I'm not. So Father, I want to surrender everything that I want to your will. I want to be about your kingdom, not my own. And Father, I just want to tell you right now, like the answer is yes. Before I even know what you're going to say. It's so much I trust you. By the way, that's hard, God, for me to trust sometimes, but I know you're good. So, Father, I'm going to come before you and ask some requests. I know some, there's some things in my life that I just need your help with. There's some hurts. There's some things with other people. I, I just want my marriage to be great. God, I want to be a great dad to my kids. Would you help direct me in that? And, Father, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. God, for everyone here, I just know that many of us need to hear from you. And so I pray this week that we would start praying in a way that we declare, surrender, and ask in a way that we hear your voice. And then, Father, help us to be obedient to that voice in our lives. We pray all this now in the name of Jesus. And we all said, amen, amen. Hey, one thing you can pray for this week is all of our camps going on this summer. And remember, next week, we're gonna talk about the most tangible way to hear from God. We'll see you then. Have a great week, CCV.